Hey guys, it's Saoirse, back for volume 2 of The Let by Charlotte Bronte, so if you haven't watched the first video, go ahead and watch that one, and reminder, many many spoilers in these videos. Um, and I have a new Bronte shirt on. Okay, so I was just gonna read the last two quotes that I had from volume 1 because I ran out of time. So here we have on page 155, again this is the Oxford World's Classics edition, um, we have one of the important encounters with Monsieur Paul, who's going to be a very, very important character. He says, You are one of those beings who must be kept down. I know you. I know you. Other people in this house see you pass and think that a colorless shadow has gone by. As for me, I scrutinized your face once and it sufficed. So finally, we have the tables turned. Lucy's always looking at other people, watching the world. Well, finally, somebody, somebody is seeing her. Somebody's watching her. And she can't really understand why anybody would be anybody would be looking at her because it's not something that she's used to. It's not something that's happened in her life before. She's always been a wallflower. <sighs> then the last quote we have for volume one is page 156. My heart almost died within me. Miserable longing strained its cords. How long were the September days? How silent, how lifeless, how vast and void seemed the desolate premises. How gloomy the forsaken garden, gray now with the dust of a town summer departed. Looking forward at the commencement of those eight weeks, I hardly knew how I was to live to the end. My spirits had long been gradually sinking. <clears throat> now that the prop of employment was withdrawn, they, re they went down fast. Even to look forward was not to hope. The dumb future spoke no comfort, offered no promise, gave no inducement to bear present evil in reliance on future good. She says, some must deeply suffer while they live, and I thrilled in the certainty that of this number I was one. So here we get a lot of um, what is talk about depression, but at this time, if you were depressed, you were basically thought of as insane. Um, so it wasn't easy to talk about. So in volume two, we see Lucy kind of leave the interiority of the first volume and become friends with Dr. John and somebody else. We'll see, we have chapter 16 is the first chapter in volume 2 and it's Auld Lang Syne. So here after Lucy has gone to Catholic confession and fainted, um, fainted like in a storm, she awakes in this home and everything's really familiar and she can't figure out why it's so familiar. She recognizes the furniture that was in Breton when she was a child. Um, then she talks to now who we recognize as Graham. Dr. John is Graham Breton. She talks to him and Mrs. Breton and they don't recognize her until this moment when Mrs. Breton is staring at her for a while. Um, and she's astounded that her son Graham has not recognized Lucy because Dr. John has been at the school for so long um, and just never knew who she was. So she reveals that she knew who Dr. John was months ago. So this is the thing about Lucy Snow, she's a very unreliable narrator. She withholds so much information from the reader, and it's, you know, is it because she thinks that we're not interested? Is it because she doesn't trust us? I think, I think it's mostly my personal opinion that she doesn't think anybody would care about her story. Um, so she kind of doesn't know what information to give us. Chapter... 17, La Terrasse. So in this one, John and Lucy are discussing Lucy's mental health and whether or not she's a Catholic, because religion is very important in this book. Um, Lucy goes to sleep at the end of this chapter, happy, happy to have friends. And then we have chapter 18, We Quarrel. Lucy and John end up discussing Ginevra, who I've said was um, kind of playing Dr. John. Um, Lucy tells John that she doesn't respect him, and then she regrets this because he gets mad, and she begs forgiveness. And they continue talking about Ginevra. So she, she'll do anything to not hurt the few people in her life that care about her. Next chapter we have is chapter 19, The Cleopatra. So Lucy goes to a gallery, and she's looking at this painting, and <clears throat> Monsieur Paul shows up and he tells her she can't look at it. Like, it's too inappropriate, because it's kind of a nude. Um, 
So she like goes away where he tells her to go and she just still looks at it. Um, and then she goes back to Dr. John, who she came to the gallery with, and they're um, laughing about Monsieur Paul's reaction. So at this point, I think as readers, we kind of don't like Monsieur Paul because he's really controlling and angry all the time. And, you know, why should he get to tell Lucy what she can and can't look at? And why does he tell her? Um, he tells her things about herself that, like, nobody else does. Like, he thinks that she's passionate and, and naughty and, like, um, I don't know, that she's hiding something. So we have chapter 20, the concert. Lucy attends a concert with John and Mrs. Breton, and she sees the king and queen of the Bascor. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to read that little quote later. Lucy sees Paul. He's angry that she's with Dr. John. She goes home again, feels happy to have spent the evening with friends. So this volume is very much about her friendships. Um, we get chapter 21, reaction. Uh, so Lucy leaves the Bretons at this point because she's been living with them for a while after the fainting spell and um, Dr. John, you know, helped her get better. John says he's going to write to her. We'll see. Um, so Paul finds Lucy crying. Interesting. Um, every time she has an interaction with him, you just wonder, like, is he going to blow up because he's such an explosive person? Which is you know, the opposite of Lucy, who keeps herself so restrained, so closed off. She's a closed book. Even to us, sometimes, as I said, because she won't tell us everything. Um, Lucy talks to Ginevra about John, and uh, she receives a letter from John, so he does actually write to her. Uh, and Paul is mad about it and makes Lucy cry in class. So, I mean, we can see like, Paul clearly has feelings for her, but he does not know how to go about it. Chapter 22, The Letter. So Lucy goes to the attic to finally read this letter she got from John. Um, and she sees this thing that happens throughout the book. She sees this nun. And you're thinking, is this a hallucination? Because there's this mysterious story about the um, school, that there's this nun that haunts it. So she keeps seeing it. She sees it in the attic. She runs for help. They come back um, with her, Madame Beck, and a few people, and um, she realizes her letter is missing. And she's freaking out, looking for the letter, because it is so precious to her. Imagine how precious this letter must be when she doesn't have family, nobody corresponds with her, nobody really speaks to her. Um, and then she realizes one of the people in the attic at this point is Dr. John. And he's pretending to comfort her, but he actually stole the letter, like saw it, picked it up, hid it from her as a joke, watched her cry about it, and then she gives he gives it back to her. So that was a point where I was like, mm, don't like him. He's just not well suited for her, but she clearly has feelings for him that I think come across as more than friendship. Um, chapter 23, Vashti. Lucy writes two letters, she tells us, for every response to Dr. John. So she writes one with feeling, which she then tears up, throws away, and then she writes one with reason, which she sends to him. Um, John arrives one evening at the school and tells Lucy they're going to the theater. They attend this transcendent performance, performance by this famous actress, and then a fire breaks out at the performance, and John and Lucy save this young girl. They go to the girl's hotel with the girl's father, and they take care of her. She thanks both of them, and then they pass the theater, and the fire has been extinguished. So this theme of, uh, there's a few themes in this book, fire and shipwrecks and storms, kind of a few of them. And you can see at certain moments, like when the fire is happening, um, that makes you think of Lucy like coming to life and then it being extinguished. She's gone back to being passive. Um, storms always mean her emotions are worked up. The shipwreck is, is a metaphor for her tragedy, her personal tragedy. And then we have chapter 24, Monsieur de Bassompierre. Um, so Lucy gets a letter from Mrs. Breton. She talks to Ginevra and finds out that Ginevra's cousins with the girl that they saved from the fire. Um, and then we find out that that girl is Polly. 
Polly from the very beginning of the book, which I totally forgot on rereading this, that Polly was going to come back and be important. Polly, or Paulina, um, is the daughter of this man who has now become rich. Like, he's gotten an, an inheritance, and so they are wealthy people. Um, Polly says that she remembers Graham and Lucy perfectly. Which is funny, because she spent a lot of time ignoring Lucy and just playing with Graham when she was little. Okay, then we have chapter 25, The Little Countess. Um, Polly and her father discover that Lucy's a teacher. And Polly's really shocked. She thought that Lucy was a rich woman and didn't have to work, but uh, her father isn't surprised. He kind of expected this. Um, so her father and John go out, and Lucy and Polly sit quietly as Polly remembers her time with Graham. And we have chapter 26, A Burial. Lucy buries all of her letters from Dr. John in a sealed jar to hide from Madame Beck, who we remember is always watching everything, spying on everybody. Um, she's doing this to try to move on from her grief. She's offered a position as Polly's companion and refuses, but she ends up taking German lessons with Polly at the hotel. Um, Lucy learns that Ginevra has made Polly think she's going to marry John, so Polly becomes very cool and dismissive of John because Polly's in love with him, like she always was, obviously, when she was a little girl and it was creepy, but now she's older and it's okay. Um, so Polly and Lucy devise this plan to catch Ginevra in her lies. Then we have chapter oh, 27, the Hotel Crecy, and this is the end of volume two. Lucy goes to an academic gala with Graham and Polly, Polly gives, no, not Polly, Monsieur Paul gives a speech, a fiery speech. Lucy talks to John, who asks her opinion of Polly, and he's rudely joking, and Lucy's serious, and this is always like, they don't really, they're just not well matched, even though they're good friends. Um, Paul says in Lucy's ear that he knows her soul is aflame, and John laughs at this, and Lucy puts up with him laughing. Then Paul apologizes, and the conversation with him gives Lucy the strength to passionately chastise Ginevra, for putting down John, because Ginevra now realizes that he prefers Polly, and she's super jealous about it because she was having fun breaking his heart. So, that is volume two. Um, and I see the end of this volume and Lucy talking with Paul as a sort of thawing of her character. So she started out the book really frozen and now she's starting to thaw out so in this volume, we see her friendships grow. Let's see, what do I have to read to you that's important here? Page 172. If I can find it. Um, as evening began to darken and the ceaseless blast still blew wild and cold and the rain streamed on deluge-like, I grew weary, very weary of my bed. The room, though pretty, was small. I felt it confining. I longed for a change. The increasing chill and gathering gloom, too, depressed me. I wanted to see, to feel firelight. So I always associate Paul with fire. When she's talking about fire, I think Paul, because she always uses these words, like fiery and explosive, to describe him. Page 175. To say anything on the subject, to hint at my discovery, had not suited my habits of thought or assimilated with my system of feeling. On the contrary, I had preferred to keep the matter to myself. I liked entering his presence covered with a cloud he had not seen through, while he stood before me under a ray of special illumination, which shone all partial over his head, trembled about his feet, and cast light no farther. So here she is in power um, through the use of observation, and she's talking about Dr. John. Page 178. When I had said my prayers, and when I was undressed and laid down, I felt that I still had friends. Friends not professing vehement attachment, not offering the tender solace of well-matched and congenial relationship, on whom therefore but moderate demand of affection was to be made, of whom but moderate expectation formed, but towards whom my heart softened instinctively and yearned with an importunate gratitude, which I entreated reason betimes to check. She says, don't let me think of them too often, too much, too fondly. She's trying to be content with um, just a, you know, calm friendship. Um... Rare, brief, unengrossing, and tranquil. Quite tranquil. So she's just trying to always tamper her expectations. 181. 
she compares herself to a lifeboat, which is interesting. Um, the difference, who is she talking about here? I don't know, but she's saying the difference between her and me might be figured by that. Between the stately ship, cruising safe on smooth seas with its full complement of crew, a captain gay and brave and venturous and provident, and the lifeboat, which most days of the year lies dry and solitary in an old dark boathouse, only putting to sea when the billows run high in rough weather, when clouds encounter, when cloud encounters water, when danger and divide, sorry, danger and death divide between them the rule of the great deep. Oh, so she's comparing herself to Mrs. Breton. So, um, we have another shipwreck scene happening here, um, where she says, My calm little room seemed somehow like a cave in the sea. There was no color about it except that white and pale green suggestive of foam and deep water. And there's a bunch of other um, nautical references. And this is really important. I hope you've finished the book because it's all foreshadowing, in my opinion. <coughs> I should drink water. Oh, cat, cat attached to my skin. Hang on. Oh, it was really painful. Okay, this is the bad thing about not having a desk here. Um, claws in flesh. <sighs> Page 196. Um, under his guidance. Under his guidance, I saw in that one happy fortnight more of Villette, its environ and its inhabitants um, than I had seen in the whole eight months of my previous residence. So she's hanging out with Dr. John at this point, and he's showing her things, and I wrote down, when you are seen, you see more. So she's experiencing more of life because she's finally being seen. Page 209. We, uh, we moved on. Where's that? We moved on. I was not at all conscious with her, but at some turn we suddenly encountered another party approaching us from the opposite direction. I just now see that group as it flashed upon me for one moment. A handsome middle-aged lady in dark velvet, a gentleman who might be her son, the best face, the finest figure I thought I had ever seen. A third person in a pink dress and black, black lace mantle. So, um, the impression was hardly felt not fixed before the consciousness that I faced a great mirror. So she's looking at herself in a mirror, didn't recognize herself, and this is such a cool thing that happens in life. Have you guys experienced this, where you don't know it's you, and then you recognize yourself? Um, the party was our own party, thus for the first and perhaps only time in my life I enjoyed the gifty of seeing myself as others see me. No need to dwell on the result. It brought a jar of discord, a pang of regret. It was not flattering, yet after all, I ought to be thankful. It might have been worse. 229. How does the time go so fast? Um, but if I feel... Oh yeah, she's talking to Reason. She has these conversations with Reason. Um, if I feel me, I never express, never declared Reason. Um, according to her, I was born only to work for a piece of bread to await the pains of death and steadily through all life to despond. To 50. Um, <laughs> Dr. John says, happiness is the cure, a cheerful mind, the preventive. Cultivate both. She says, no mockery in this world ever sounds so sh to me so hollow as that of being told to cultivate happiness. What does such advice mean? Happiness is not a potato to be planted in mold and tilled with manure. Happiness is a glory shining far down upon us out of heaven. She is a divine dew which the soul on certain of its summer mornings feels dropping upon it from the amaranth bloom and golden fruitage of paradise. So that's how I feel when people tell me, oh, just be happy, like, get over it. What's depression? It's not real. 259, the strong magnetism of genius drew my heart out of its wonted orbit. The sunflower turned from the south to a fierce light, not solar, a rushing red cometary light, hot on vision and to sensation. I had seen acting before but never anything like this. That's when she's watching the actress, and it's just a beautiful passage that you should look at, but I don't have time to read all of it. 266. Those who live in retirement, whose lives have fallen amid the seclusion of schools or of other walled-in and guarded dwellings, are liable to be suddenly and for a long time, for a long while, dropped out of the memory of their friends, the denizens of a freer world. Um... The hermit, if he be a sensible hermit, will swallow his own thoughts and lock up his own emotions during these weeks of inward winter. He will know that destiny designed him to imitate on occasion the dormouse, and he will be conformable, make a tidy ball of himself, creep into a hole of life's wall, and submit decently to the drift which blows in and soon blocks him up, 
preserving him in ice for the season. That is so sad. 274. Um, long may it be generally thought that physical privations alone merit compassion, and the rest is a, f a figment. So this is a reference to, at this time, in the Victorian era, um, if you weren't suffering physically, nobody cared. Like, mental suffering was not a thing. You were just crazy. <clears throat> 296. Um, if life be a war, it seemed my destiny to conduct it single-handed. Some of these are short. 301. What contradictory attributes of character we sometimes find ascribed to us, according to the eye with which we are viewed. I just thought that was perfect, because she's just not used to being seen, and then she has all of these people who are seeing her and telling her their opinions of her, like, um, Ginevra, Dr. John, Mrs. Breton, and, of course, Monsieur Paul. 306. Um, Ginevra says, who are you, Miss Snow? And, and Lucy says, um, who am I indeed? Perhaps a personage in disguise. Pity I don't look the character. So she's, like, kind of playing with Ginevra, enjoying this fact that Ginevra thinks that Lucy's hiding something, that she's, like, almost an undercover secret agent or something. And, um, does Lucy really know who she is? Like, what do you think? Do you think she is just playing this game and she, she does know her true character or throughout this whole book is trying to figure out what her true character is and maybe can't? Um, I think in a way she does know, but doesn't really feel that she needs to express it to people because she feels like nobody will ever listen or understand anyway. Um, on page 318, um, Paul tells Lucy in French, there's a lot of French in this book, um, he says that she has fire in her soul. So here he is like shouting at her, telling her like, you're on fire, you like, you have passion. <clears throat> Which is just crazy to her. She cannot believe that, that he sees that in her. Nobody else does. Page 321. Whoa. I have no idea. Okay, my outraged sense of justice at last and suddenly caught fire. An explosion ensued, for I could be passionate too. So, um, with all of these encounters with Monsieur Paul, she's becoming more fiery. She's lighting up. She's melting the snow of her character, if you will. Um, so that's the end of what I've got for volume two. Oh my goodness, I wish that my camera didn't shut off after 25 minutes because then I'd have a lot more time to actually talk about things. So I hope it's making sense so far. Basically, um, Lucy has emerged from almost this cocoon and is sort of being forced into living. Because as she said, she would be content to just like mend socks and do absolutely nothing and as long as she's not severely suffering, then, hey, that's all she can expect from life, right? Because to her, life is never going to be what it is for people like Polly or Ginevra, um, who have beauty and money and admirers. Lucy thinks she will just always be ignored. Um, you know, she says over and over that she's, she's very plain. You know, people don't look at her. So the fact that Monsieur Paul is looking at her and... Um, seeing something that either upsets him or excites him, we don't know, but he is certainly acting like a jerk most of the time. Uh, but she's, I think, kind of fascinated by the fact that, that he is just taking an interest in her um, and, and what she is doing and saying. And then and she just, she's not even trying to get attention or anything, you know? She tries actually very hard to not get attention in her life, um, to kind of just fade into the background and not really exist to people. Um, she really works to cultivate that kind of demeanor. Um, but Paul sees right through it, and that makes him a very interesting character at this point in the book. Um, and then in the third volume, we're going to find that it's pretty much all about him and about Lucy's changing feelings for him. So we will dig into that in volume three. <sighs> There is always so much to say, and I feel like I should just make like 10 videos about this. But anyway, let me know what you think and if this is at all helpful or whatever. I'm having fun. So see you next time for volume three of Villette.